I guarantee that you have sat in one of these chairs. Everyone has. It's the most popular chair in the world. The monoblock, the classic plastic garden chair. Well designed, but not exactly built to last. And if you've ever broken one, you probably do what most people do and bend it. And understandably, because these can't go in your standard curbside recycling, just like those old broken garden toys or even those cracked plant pots that have been sat in your shed for years. So since we've got our very own plastic recycling workshop, we thought we'd set ourselves a challenge and see if we can recycle this plastic garden junk. But before we try melting this stuff down and making something from it, let's look a little bit more at the problem we're dealing with here. <sighs> Chances are, one of these chairs has been in your garden at some point, or maybe at your grand's, or maybe that cafe down the road. They're cheap, stackable, and weatherproof. Pretty much the trifecta when it comes to outdoor furniture. But it's not just chairs, plant pots, watering cans, toys. It's safe to say if it goes in the garden, there's probably a plastic version of it. And that's because from around the 1960s and 70s, plastic became the go-to material for anything that was found in the garden. You could mold it into almost any shape. It didn't rot like wood and it didn't corrode like metal. But that durability has a dark side because while these plastics are designed to survive the elements, that also means they survive well, pretty much anything. So we put a post out on our local Facebook group asking if anyone had any old broken garden plastic that they wanted to get rid of. And it's safe to say we got a lot of replies. For a bit of context, even just in the UK, we produce over 500 million plastic plant pots every single year. And globally, it's estimated that there are about a billion of these plastic chairs. One writer described them as the plastic elephant in the room, an icon of globalization, but also a symbol of the throwaway culture that urgently needs to be addressed. And that's the kicker, because even when most of it could be recycled, it just isn't. The vast majority of broken toys, furniture, or plant pots, anything in the garden really, is just being burnt or going to landfill. Here in the UK, around 87% of councils don't even recycle your plastic plant pots. And you'll see plenty of products in the garden center being labeled as biodegradable or eco, but the vast majority of that is just greenwashing. Most so-called compostable plastics only break down in industrial facilities, not in your compost heap like we're led to believe. Most of this stuff is made from polypropylene or PP, which is technically recyclable, but in practice, not so much. Only about 3% of polypropylene actually gets recycled, which is way lower than plastics like PET or HDPE. And even when it is recycled, people often say it's not worth it because apparently, apparently, the plastic loses strength or becomes brittle and degrades over time. So the common view is that garden junk isn't really recyclable in a useful way. But is that actually true? Well, let's put that to the test and see if there's a way that this huge source of plastic waste can be given another life. So now we've got all of the junk here in the workshop, we need to make sure we know what it's made from. I have a sneaking suspicion most of it is gonna be polypropylene because that's typically what outdoor stuff is made from, but we need to scan it because if we accidentally mix different types of plastics together, it means it can't be recycled in the future. So we're gonna make sure everything is separated. So we're gonna use our Plastel. This device uses infrared technology to scan the material. And as long as it's not a super dark color that absorbs the light, it will tell you what it is. This is PP. That right there is the PP pile. And we can just basically go through every single piece of plastic we have. So this chair, also PP. Now that's black, so that's annoying. So instead of being able to scan it, what we have to do is we have to look for a logo. Here you go, but right there. Can you see that, George? If that didn't have a logo on it, there are other ways to figure it out, but yeah, we wouldn't be able to necessarily guarantee you use it. So I'm gonna go through every bit of plastic here, work out what it is and put it into piles and have separate piles depending on the separate plastics that we find. PP, these are PP. This is all polypropylene, so probably 90% of the stuff we collected polypropylene. We've got a little bit of HDPE, and then we've got one thing, which is very, very brittle polystyrene. Um, a lot of these vacuum formed plant trays are always polystyrene. We can recycle all of this material, but we want to keep it separate. So if it works, we'll use this stuff to we'll test it works. And if it works, we can try this stuff later on. Interestingly, this thing is polypropylene, but the little green antennae are HDPE, so these, <laughs> we'll get these red bits off, but these need to be in a separate pile so that when we recycle it again, we're not mixing materials. Another interesting thing is just how brittle the polypropylene gets. Like that is the inside of one of these kids toy rockers things. And then look at the outside, it's like almost white. You can probably snap this with your hand. It's very, very brittle. And that's just because of the UV exposure. But interestingly, compared to the HDPE, this little rocker here, other than being very grubby and dirty, nothing wrong with it. So actually, we might be able to just clean this up a bit. I think this will be fine, and we won't have to spend any energy recycling it. We can just reuse it as it is. So that would be a win. And then we'll try cleaning all this stuff up 
and we'll see if it works. Right, it's a new day and I've dried off a little bit after all that jet washing. Essentially what we need to do is we need to process all this material down into usable stuff. And I mean, that kind of just sums up, doesn't it really? <laughs> I was gonna, just about to tell you about some of the UV damaged plastics and I was, I'd pick these three, but I think this one's gonna have to, have to go in the mix now. The plan is to take the more UV damaged stuff and separate that from all the stuff that's slightly less UV. Maybe it's not been outside for quite so long. Like these plant pots look, look okay. And when we're testing, it'd be interested to see if the UV exposure has an impact on whether it turns into a new product any better or any worse. The three plus this guy now, I'm gonna chop these up separately, keep these separate, shred them separately, test that first, and then we'll chop all these guys up and we'll test them after. And hopefully I don't fall on my bum again. Put in a big tarp down because that way we don't spread microplastics everywhere. Everything will land on here. We can tip that into the box and shred it all together. Obviously, no sun exposure, hence why the nice red material. So it's definitely going to be weaker, it's just how much weaker. We need the jigsaw or shall I just stand on it? <laughs> I can already hear it cracking. Look at, that, look at the difference there, it's like completely glossy and powdery white. It must have been stored upside down in someone's garden, must not it? You'd think it'd be the other way around. choosing to trust another broken chair. We'll see. So wherever possible, if we can avoid needing to use the power tools that throw plastic everywhere, even when we collect as much of it as we can, we can avoid having to do it in the first place. It saves a bit of energy, saves a bit of mess, saves a bit of time, and maybe a bit safer, even though my safety techniques are impeccable, as you can see. So last thing we want to do is try and work out what material the seat is. Annoyingly, you can't scan it on the plaz tail because it's too dark. So it's unknown, too dark. The infrared light can't bounce off of it. So the next best thing is to work out by looking at the code on it. Now this does have a code, <laughs> but ridiculously, the code says number five LDPE. And we know that LDPE is number four. Number five is actually polypropylene. So what is this? We don't know, and it's, there are other ways to tell, but that's why recycling is seen as this ridiculous scam because not even the companies can do it properly with the codes. Ah. Oh, that's actually quite heavy. One of these and one of these out of these materials, please. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. really interesting so that is the uv damaged plastic it's got this like texture to it like that powderiness like the uv damaged plastic had before we shredded it up didn't quite fill we actually ran it twice this one almost got there but didn't quite fill and polypropylene should flow pretty well so this one 
is the one with no, well, less UV damage, and it feels fine. There's obviously something happening there. There's something happening with the flow rate happening because of the UV breakdown. Not great, doesn't work well for injection. Also, these pots are just really small, and in order to use all that plastic we've made, you're gonna have to make about 3,000 of these. So we're gonna come up with a different plan to use more plastic and use all of it instead of just a bit of it. So this is our extrusion machine, and this is different to our injection molding machine because it has a screw inside which constantly is churning all the plastic up. So the worry with all of the UV damage stuff being a potential failure of a product when we injection mold it might not be an issue here because it's all mixed together and actually should produce something fairly good. Okay, our first ever beam made from plastic garden junk that we found outside. And actually, it looks really good. It's a nice, consistent color. The issues that we had with injection molding and it causing a fail didn't happen with this because that extruder is churning it all together. Um, you get a really nice, consistent charcoal-y gray color. The other good thing is that this pot uses about 100 grams of plastic, whereas this is about one and a half kilos. So in order to use the same amount of plastic, we need to make 15 pots and that way you've got, obviously, got 15 pots, great, but now we've got complete freedom as to what we want to make out of this beam. We can make furniture, we can make lots of other things. And also, this is about 10 minutes work, and that's about an hour and a half. So this feels like the right way forward for all this plastic junk. So we just need to figure out what it is we want to make from all of this stuff. Now, in the past, we've made furniture, we've made a bright blue bench, we even made a pallet out of recycled plastic. But seeing as this is something that came from the garden, we figured maybe it'd be fun to make something that's to go back in the garden as a bit of a full circle picture. Also, we've got this working theory that because the plastic had or might have had some sort of UV stabilization built into it when it was made because it has to live outside, that maybe we would have retained some of that and our big giant beams here might have a little bit of stabilization going forward so that they break down a little bit slower. That is very much just a working theory. Not a lot of science has gone into that decision, but if it works, fantastic. It just means it will last a bit longer. If not, I guess we'll never know. There is another option we have. We could do something like we did with this stool, where you actually plane the surface flat and get rid of this uh, texture on the top there. Now, we quite like the texture, and uh, obviously the downside to doing that is you create more waste in the process. So if we don't have to do that, that would be nice. The other thing with this texture is that it actually could be beneficial, and it could be maybe used for something like decking, add a bit of grip maybe. It's got a bit of this kind of wood grain look to it, which is quite cool. But as it turns out, we actually already have a solution for decking. So Tanzite make these awesome decking boards, which are made out of natural stone powder with just the right amount of moisture, which are then compacted to make each board. Now they've sent us their Appalachian sample box to check it out and put it through its paces. Now these boards are surprisingly heavy and they feel really premium, but they've made some big claims. So let's put them to the test. Scratch resistance. Burn resistance. Weatherproof. Non-flip. and overall durability. So as you can tell from our extremely scientific testing, they weren't exaggerating. Compared to traditional wood decking, this stuff doesn't fade, doesn't stain, doesn't go moldy. All you need to do is give it a quick wash with soapy water every once in a while. Plus, since this stuff never needs refinishing, that means you're using zero harmful chemicals that can potentially hurt the environment. So you're free just to enjoy your lovely decking. So if you're thinking this could be perfect for your lovely plastic junk-free garden, Check out the link below and you can order your very own sample box and you can get 50% off if you use code BROTHERSMAKE. Did I nail it? <laughs> and if you love it as much as we do, installation is super straightforward. They've got a bunch of guides and videos over on their website to help you every step of the way. Right, so that rules out decking for these beams, but we've given it some thought and we reckon a raised bed or a planter could be the perfect application. As it's made of plastic, a little bit like those stone decking boards, there's no maintenance because you're not gonna have to refinish it or repaint it at the end of each season. And also, you're not gonna need to put a liner in there because the plastic isn't gonna rot like wood. So let's show you the plan. Okay, I've been doing some sketching and I think to maximize this 1.2 meter length of plastic, we're gonna make an 80 centimeter planter with a little bit on the end is gonna be the short section and that is gonna give us the best efficiency of all the material we can use and minimize the amount of waste. It also means we're gonna need 18 beams in total. We've got one, so that's 17 more and that's gonna total 27 kilos of plastic. If we were injection molding it using these pots, we'd need to make almost 300 for the same amount. So definitely gonna be make more sense using extrusion. Let's get cracking.
Ça fout All right, Matthew. Oh. So on this video, we set out to answer one question. Does garden junk still have a use after it's broken or doesn't really work anymore? Yes. Thanks for watching. <laughs> yeah, I think it definitely does. I think there's, it depends on what you do with it. It depends on how, I think the key factor is the UV damage. That seems to be the biggest thing that impacts how recyclable something is. Definitely, the fact that it's broken has no impact whatsoever. Yeah, if it's fine. broken or if it's in one piece, it doesn't matter, it still works really well. It's when it's UV damaged, that's when it starts to have a problem with things like flow rate and whether it's gonna fill the mold properly. Yeah, but as we've shown here, like all you have to do is you just dilute it a little bit with something that's got better flow rate in this case we used again still fully broken recycled stuff a lot of companies will tell you you have to use virgin plastic in order to dilute it and make it reusable again but that's just not the case at least not for what we found here just cut it with a little bit of that stuff that hadn't been seen the sun quite so much and it worked fine yeah exactly i do think it's a really nice application for like big chunky things there's so much garden waste out there it's such a massive source of plastic waste mm. but with something like this it's got kilos in that yeah it's a lot of plastic much more than those little pots that we were making at the start and it's just yeah a good way to recycle a lot of stuff success just want to say a huge huge thank you to all of our wonderful wonderful patrons over on brotherhood we're actually you might have noticed it in the video but our workshop's a bit of a building site at the moment a little bit but we are in the process of expanding it it's getting it's going to be like three times the size. Three times. So that is all the money that's come from Patreon. So thank you so much to them. It's all because of you wonderful people. And an extra, extra special thank you to our two eco legends, Jessica Greer and Elizabeth from Trash Club Brooklyn. See you later. <laughs> You've been eating a lot. <laughs> 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 I was going to do the same thing to you. <laughs> Brothers, eh?